So uh, I'm Josh uh, Rosen, and I work on the uh, Spark team at Databricks. And you've heard a lot about Spark in sort of the talks today, and now I'm going to tell you what it is. Uh, so sort of as a motivator, you know, in a lot of different fields, we have this problem where we have data and problems that have sort of outpaced what you can, or outgrown what you could process on a single machine. So people are turning to sort of large compute clusters for performing, you know, data processing tasks. And the question is, how do you make programming these easy? You know, you have to worry about you know, issues related to fault tolerance and networking, and it's, it's much more complicated than doing it on a single machine. So Apache Spark is a framework designed for writing these sorts of large-scale cluster computing data analysis programs. Um, and it's sort of interoperable with you know, Hadoop. And uh, compared to a lot of these other systems, uh, Spark offers a few nice benefits. Uh, Spark is able to leverage the large amounts of memory that are available on modern compute clusters to give you big performance benefits. And it also has a very rich uh, computation model of a, lot of a wide array of primitives. And as a result, it can actually achieve large speed ups compared to systems like Hadoop for certain workloads. If your data fits in memory, which some data sets will, you can be hundreds of times faster. And even if it doesn't, you can see pretty you know, decent speed ups. And it also offers a lot of sort of nice you know, usability advantages too. Uh, Spark as a framework is usable in Java and API and Python. And you can use it for sort of batch workloads, but you can also be sitting at an interactive prompt and doing data analysis too. So what's kind of cool, at the core of Spark is this basic primitive that we call the resilient distributed data set. And the idea is, is that it's a big immutable collection of objects that's partitioned and distributed across the cluster. But you can sort of you know, address it and operate on it as if it was just a regular collection in a programming language like Python or Scala. So the usual workflow to writing a program in Spark is you load your data to create one of these RDDs, you know, say from a text file. Uh, you perform operations and transformations to sort of yield new RDDs, say, by filtering your original data, by transforming each element, things like that. And then you can actually sort of fire off jobs to sort of kick off computations once you've described these sort of data transformations. And this will be executed in parallel on your cluster. So Spark uh, gives you this sort of rich set of collection-oriented libraries for describing your distributed computation and a uh, execution engine for sort of efficiently executing this on the cluster and taking advantage of memory. So this is sort of the basic core abstraction of Spark, these distributed parallel collections that you can operate on. Um, and this is a really good fit for a lot of problems. Uh, but you know, there's a, a wide variety of tasks that people want to do with data. Uh, you, know, you may have stuff like batch processing, but you may also want to do sort of more specialized things. Your computation and data might be graph structured, and you want to use a specialized graph processing system. You might be dealing with streaming data. Maybe your data is, uh, you want to issue sort of SQL-style queries against it, because that's sort of a nice way to express that computation. Perhaps your data, uh, you want to do interactive latency queries and exploration. So there's been this sort of proliferation of different systems for doing sort of pieces of this task, systems like Storm and GraphLab and Impala that sort of have addressed pieces of this sort of puzzle. Where I think one of the nice sort of big you know, selling points of Spark is that in addition to the sort of Spark core, uh, we ship a set of standard libraries on top for doing all of these tasks, uh, for structured data processing, streaming, graph processing, and machine learning. Um, so this means that uh, you, know, you can do a lot of stuff out of the box in Spark in sort of one unified system. So I'm going to give you just sort of a quick whirlwind tour of sort of all of the neat high-level abstractions that we offer, um, starting with MLlib. So MLlib, uh, which you'll see more in John V's talk, is a, ta is a uh, library for distributed machine learning. And uh, so we have parallel distributed uh, versions of many popular ML algorithms. Uh, it's a very active project. We've had over 70 open source contributors. Um, and the library of algorithms is very broad in scope and growing every day and runs the gamut from classification to regression to clustering. Uh, there's even some more stuff that's not on the slide, like sort of summary statistics, things like that. Uh, GraphX, another addition to the sort of Spark stack, is a big distributed graph processing library. The idea is that you sort of express a sort of resilient distributed graph, and then you can sort of do transformations and actions and filtering and jobs on that. And in addition to providing sort of low-level primitives for designing your own graph algorithms, it has a large standard library that you can sort of use too. Spark Streaming is another kind of cool addition of the Spark platform that was sort of featured in some of the work that you saw earlier. 
the idea behind Spark Streaming is that if you imagine sort of a, uh, you can sort of approach it from two directions. You can imagine iteratively running a batch job whenever new data comes in. And if you take the frequency with which you run that job and make it more frequent so that your interval becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, sort of in the limit, you get something that looks like a streaming system. So that's basically what Spark Streaming is. If you have a stream of sort of real-time live data coming in, we take that stream and break it into discrete chunks, and then we can operate on those discrete chunks using Spark. And because Spark can store data in memory and operate very, very low latency, it can return an answer in less than a second in you know, cases, you can uh, do sort of semi-real-time streaming. And you know, this is not you know, necessarily record at a time streaming latencies. You're still dealing with small chunks. But you can push it down to you know, half a second, a second-ish, which is very suitable for many problems. And the kind of cool part about this is the underlying execution engine of Spark I didn't have to change that much. It's the same engine, and it's for batch processing and streaming. So it provides sort of neat opportunities to sort of unify these two paradigms in you know, one application. Another sort of cool recent addition to the Spark stack is a uh, library called Spark SQL. Uh, you know, you might be familiar with accessing a SQL database for sort of querying structured data. Um, and Spark sort of lets you issue these types of queries. The kind of neat part about this, though, is it integrates with the rest of the Spark stack. The result of your query can be an RDD, which you can then do further processing on. Um, for instance, here, I've actually filtered a database of people and then uh, done some sort of map reduce style processing on the results, all in the same system without having had to leave it. So what's kind of cool about this, too, is that um, it allows you to kind of go in the opposite direction, too. You can take data uh, that you might have transformed via some other process and treat it as sort of structured data of a schema that you can issue these types of structured queries against. For instance, you can, your data might come in as this sort of semi-structured mess of JSON. Uh, you can tell Spark SQL about it. It can extract and learn a schema, and then you can issue these very natural queries against it. So one sort of nice thing, though, about having all of these libraries on the same common runtime engine and stack is that you can actually have workflows that span them. For instance, uh, I might have a set of tweets uh, that I've collected via some offline process and stored somewhere. I can use Spark SQL to load up my tweets and query them. In this instance, I'm grabbing some longitude and lat latitude pairs of my tweets. Using the result of this sort of data loading and feature extraction, I can pass this to MLlib to do some uh, machine learning. In this case, I can do k-means clustering uh, on locations on tweets. And then finally, I can take the sort of learned model from my machine learning task and apply it to a real-time stream of incoming data in Spark Streaming. And the cool part about this is I can express this as a single program without having to you know, glue a bunch of different systems together. And the sort of neat part about this unification is that in addition to being easier to the program, it can give you big efficiency benefits. Uh, you know, imagine that I had uh, you know, three separate systems for doing this process, where uh, the text got a little bit messed up here. But you know, I do my feature extraction, my machine learning, and my predictions. And to sort of transit data across these systems, uh, in addition to being sort of operationally difficult to keep three separate systems running, it can be expensive because you have to ship it out of one system into another. They might speak different data formats. In Spark, uh, you can read your data in and then just do one processing pipeline for uh, the whole thing, which is pretty neat. The other sort of nice advantage about this is that because these high-level libraries are built on sort of the same low-level uh, substrate, any optimizations that we do there basically come for free. If we make benefits to Spark Shuffle, uh, that's going to benefit machine learning algorithms. If we can sort of reduce the latency in its scheduler, now you've gotten the faster streaming engine, things like that. I think one of the most exciting things about Spark is uh, the growth of its community. Spark, uh, right now, I think has over 250 uh, distinct people that have made contributions to it from 50 different companies. And I think uh, we are, by a decent margin, probably the most active open source project in big data. Um, you know, you know, by a lot of metrics, by number of contributors. Uh, it's also a very rapidly evolving project. It looks like we lost chart labels here too, but this is Spark on this side. And you know, we, are, we are literally at this point like merging 10, you know, 10, 15 distinct patches a day. It's kind of just crazy the pace of, of change and new features and innovation that's happening. And you can sort of see this reflected like, you know, this sort of exponential growth of community contribution. 
So anyhow, so uh, Spark is an Apache top level open source project. We're very uh, welcome and friendly to new contributors. You might start by something as small as I found a typo in the docs or as big as you know, I want to contribute a big new feature or a new machine learning algorithm or make graph processing faster, uh, something like that. So sort of in a nutshell, uh, you know, big data analytics has sort of evolved. It spans, you know, people are wanting to do a lot of different things. They are having data that's big data being ingested via streaming systems. They want to issue interactive queries. You want to do complex analytics and machine learning on their data. And Spark is sort of one unified platform that lets you do all of these in the same system. And that's pretty cool. 